Uh, first, I just want to summarize this state question, 801. There are five on the ballot, and they aren't as exciting as medical marijuana <laughs> or um, the alcohol question a couple of years ago. Uh, the room was packed for those, but we should mention that um, uh, th this is a very interesting question, more interesting than people really uh, are, uh, are aware of. It would amend the state constitution to allow school districts to spend revenues from a portion of their voter approved property taxes or ad valorem taxes, specifically their building fund tax revenue on operational costs, which could be teacher pay or textbooks. Currently, building fund revenue must be spent to build, repair, or remodel school buildings or purchase furniture. Uh, it is also often used to cover other costs of things such as fire insurance, security personnel, janitorial salaries, utility costs, even band instruments, as I understand. So that definition has broadened over time. But So we'd like to start out really with our guests and ask a, a very basic question. Uh, and I'll start with um, uh, Jennifer Moneys, Ms. Moneys. Um, why, uh, you, with the state chamber, they have come out in support of this question. What are the reasons? Yeah, so thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. Obviously, school funding isn't as sexy as you know medical marijuana, but uh, we appreciate you all being here and, and understanding that this is an important issue for our schools across the state, so thank you for having me. Um, you know, we ultimately, we think that local control over local dollars is never a bad thing. So whenever, you know, this, this does not raise taxes, it's not a mandate on any school, so no school will have to change anything that they do if state question 801 passes, but it, instead it gives schools the flexibility to say if they have additional funds in their building fund that they'd like to spend on things like teacher pay, textbooks, technology, and things in their general operating dollar you know, budget, that we think they should be able to do that. We think that local communities are best to decide how to spend their local dollars. So that's why we're supporting state question 801, and we hope you will too. Uh, I'd like to just follow up quickly with a question. Sure. What gave rise to this proposal that ended up on the ballot? It came, from, of course, from a Senate joint resolution in the legislature. But was there something that occurred or some issue that arose? And what got the attention of the state chamber for you know, trying to sure. push, put this forth to, for a vote of the people? Yeah, so we have a broader um, issue that we're tackling and Sean is a part of that as well as looking at you know as part of the state chamber this year unveiled what's called the OK 2030 initiative so looking at a statewide vision for Oklahoma and as part of that school funding formula reform and looking taking a top to bottom look at our school funding formula and saying how are we funding our schools currently and um, we know up on this stage how complicated the school funding formula is. I always joke that there are about five people across the state that understand the school funding formula. I hope that there are two of us that are sitting up here that somewhat do. Um, but you know, from that standpoint, OK2030 has really emphasized taking a top to bottom look at the school funding formula and saying, are we funding the schools in a way that makes sense? Do we need to streamline it? Do we need more transparency when it comes to that? So we understand that this is just a first step in looking at a more comprehensive approach to our school funding formula, but we do think that this is a first step toward making sure that schools are able to use as much of their funds as possible for local community needs. Mr. Heim, I know the Oklahoma State School Boards Association has not taken a, an official position on the state question, uh, but uh, as I understand, you may have some concerns. So, so let us know what your thoughts are, your concerns are about state question 801. I have local control of local do dollars. I think that's tattooed across my forehead based on <laughs> what my school board members want me to do. Uh, so the real issue as this has come through is as I go around the state, talk to school board members, educators, business leaders, there's some misunderstanding because a lot of the conversation, David, I thank you, the way, thank you for the way you framed this, that the discussion is about allowing local ad valorem money to be used for things like teacher salary, people feel like this is going to increase revenue. And I don't want people to look at this a year from now, three years from now, like the lottery or something else. Well, what happened to state question 801 that we voted to increase revenue? This is talking about a very finite amount of money, the building fund, that's already being spent on building operations. And as you said, David, 
for the last decade or more, we, through statute, we've been able to expand the use of that fund to band instruments and software, uh, maintenance salaries. All of our schools, as you look at school coding, school funding, our schools are spending one and a half to three times their current uh, amount of building fund for those things that are approved by the building fund. So I'd really like to make sure the voters understand it doesn't increase funding. And if we really want to do something for schools, why aren't we sitting here talking about allowing the increase of funding in the same constitutional so, uh, portion of the Constitution that we already have some money that is allowable to go to teacher pay and other things. Let's look at increasing that local revenue, letting voters increase that revenue to pay for some of these things and help the revenue in our state go up for public education. And you Go ahead. I was just going to add to that. I mean, I just to say, you know, I mean, we don't disagree with anything that, that you just said. You know, this, we, you know, whenever you, you say, you know, it doesn't add money into schools, we, you know, our way to say that is it doesn't raise taxes. And so that's good <laughs> <laughs> for the communities right. at large. But, you know, this doesn't change anything about the fact that there is an ongoing conversation about the need for more funding in education. That is a conversation that's going to continue. You know, we saw teachers come up to the Capitol in force last legislative session. We know that that voice is really strong and powerful. We saw it. Senator Dossett saw it. Um, and so we know that that's going to continue. I don't think that state question 801, it doesn't, it doesn't address that piece. That's a conversation that's going to keep going. This is about giving local communities flexibility to right. use the money that they have now. And again, we're definitely in favor of that. Uh, again, part of our concern is the misunderstanding. And as I've talked to school leaders, they really have a concern about that. Uh, we've had zero schools tell us they support it or that they're looking to use it because they can already spend that money. Sometimes we feel, feel like we have diversion from real issues that can help schools to something that may be misunderstood as we move forward as helping schools and hope the legislature and the public wouldn't think that this improved education for funding when it's, it's not going to impact it one, one bit. Do you, Mr. Heim, do you think uh, there is uh, some other motive involved here in trying to propose this measure? And I'm not speaking necessarily of the state chamber either. I mean, it was voted on in the Senate and right. the House. Um, now, Senator Bice, who authored this, is a great friend of public education. Senator Bice has helped us with a lot of issues that we want to uh, see go through the legislative level. So I'm not saying that there was any uh, bad motive. I think it was in a time where we were looking at helping schools and I think she had the, the intent to help with flexibility and again that's why we haven't taken a position on it. We trust our local boards to do the right thing. We're going to, if, if it passes, we're going to have to do a lot of education with local boards to ensure that they don't take a shortcut to thinking we're going to pay teacher salaries in a school that many of our schools have to take building fund two, three, four, five years in a row and, and save it just to put a roof on their high school. Well, if you spend it on teacher salaries for three years, now you're obligated forever for those teacher salaries because we can't legally reduce those and we need a roof. How are we going to pay for that roof? Well, some of our school districts don't have a mechanism for that. They either property value is too low to pass a bond issue at that level or they've never been able to pass a bond issue at all because of local issues. So those are the things that we're going to have to have a lot of public education about the unintended consequences if you were to use this in the manner we're talking about. And we just think, you know, that local school boards have the ability to make those decisions. I know yeah. Sean agrees, you know, that local school boards, they're elected and superintendents are, are paid to make the best recommendations for their district. And so at the end of the day, we think local school districts and local school boards should be able to make those decisions for their district. Uh, I mean, we had looked at the data for the millage. This would, uh, this allows five mills. Uh, you can go over and above uh, by five mills, which I think is uh, uh, $1 per thousand dollars of uh, assessment on taxable property. So, uh, but every district in the whole state is maxed out yes. at the five mills. And some are over five mills because there's a personal property tax exemption. So they go 5.3, 5.8, 5.6. But the point is, Ms. Monies, do you think any school districts are going to decide to use any of the, this money for operations? 
I, I think that that's a conversation that I hope happens across the state. I mean, I agree that ultimately there'll be a lot of conversations that school boards will have to have with their teachers to say, should we take one mill, I don't, half a mill, whatever it looks like, out of our building fund, if we have carryover in our building fund that we aren't using, that should we take some of that money and put it toward teacher pay, put it toward textbooks, put it toward things that our community decides are important for our students. And, and so I think that those are conversations that we welcome. I think that personally, I think that, that those are conversations that need to be happening at the local school board level. That's not something that right now the state has an arbitrary, you know, this five mills that's kind of locked in a lockbox, right? For, for what reason? Like why five mills? Why, you know, that? So I, I think that those are conversations that I look forward to having across the state to say, why are we putting five mills toward a building fund? There are many districts that will choose to continue to do exactly what they're doing. They under, if state question 801 passes, nothing changes if they want to choose to continue to spend, take five mills and put it in their building fund. But there are some districts, I think, that at least will have the conversation to say, should we take some of that money and put it toward something on the operational side that we're not doing currently? I hope those conversations happen. Well, I think part of that, and they could take that conversation, but the conversation is going to ultimately come back to they're already spending far more than they have available for those building fund needs. They are going to already spend it on many operational sides, so it's not really, doesn't really free it up for operations. We're one of only four states in the nation that we get zero dollars for capital improvement from the state level. So our schools are 100 percent beholden to the state for that, as for the local five mills, the five mills is locked in. So that small amount is all they can spend on those building fund items plus bond issue money. So our, our schools that are really low in property value, that's gonna be a concern. Again, we can educate them. I just want our, the public to talk to their school leaders before they vote on this. If they pass it, I want them to understand that maybe someday we'll be sitting on this stage talking about doubling the, the building fund. Let's talk about that. I mean, if we really want to give local control, could we, could we look at doubling the building fund, allowing local voters to vote for that tax increase? I mean, if we're really about local control, can we have more local control about increasing those tax levies? If I want to raise my property taxes, can I vote for that? That's, I want people to know this doesn't do any of that. This, and we want the local discussion, but we can't have the local discussion about raising taxes and actually increasing funding which it makes it really difficult for it to give the intended outcome. Well, before we get to that question, let me ask you, why not flexibility? I mean, if the districts yeah. have the choice and the public and understands, no, we're what's wrong with that? We're, we're for that. I'm not against the flexibility. Again, we have been a part of, personally, as a CFO and a superintendent, as we've gone through the last decade, through statute, we have given more flexibility about the building fund, what we would call carryover or crossover funds crossover funds that will go for building fund or general fund. So we have so many of those now that can go to maintenance salaries, all of your utilities, gas, electric, uh, anything associated with the building. You said band instruments, software for technology. There's so many of those now that there's not any building fund left somewhere that's not being used. We don't have a school in the state that has excess building fund and looking for some place to spend it. So that's kind of the misnomer in this that somehow schools are going to have, they have a fund sitting there and I can't touch it because I don't have enough things to use it for, so I need to spend that on teacher salaries. We would all love to do that, but there's not any money available for that. Well, and to me, I think, you know, I, I guess I don't understand the argument of, like, well, we're already doing it, so why should we oppose state question 801? Well, we're not I opposing mean, it. So <laughs> okay. I'm just, I just want the voters. I just, to me, like, to, it, yeah. yeah, but it's like, okay, so we're doing it, so let's make the statute, you know, reflect current practice and put in place a situation where local school districts, I mean, I don't think uniformly school districts are spending it on all of those things, right? It's kind of a mismatch of you have some school districts being more loose with how they're spending, you know, on band instruments and other things and maybe districts that aren't being as creative with how they're spending their, their building fund dollars. So I think state question 801 just clears it all up, says we can use all of that money for operations. Whatever you want to spend it on local community, you can spend it on that. I should point out that um, there is opposition to it. I mean, if you look at the vote on the sure. Senate joint resolution, 
it was stark. It was 28-15 uh, <laughs> in the Senate, 57-14 in the House. Everyone who voted in favor was Republican. Well, I Not a single yeah. Democrat voted in favor of it, but there were some Republicans who voted against it, right. uh, mostly in rural areas. On the other hand, there were those yeah. in rural areas who voted in favor of it, too. Well, I think that conversation on the Senate floor was about it helping schools have more money somehow. That's the fear. Why would we be voting on it if it's not helping schools? And I hope that Jennifer helps me if it passes at the legislative level this year and the state chamber helps me explain to legislators this did not free up money for teacher salaries. We still need to invest in our schools. We're still dead last in the region in per pupil funding. We have to do something to have a long-term investment in our schools and this did not do it. And I just think that conversation is definitely going to continue. Good. I mean, no matter what. And, and, you know, State Question 801 isn't going to change that. It's just going to give local school districts flexi flexibility, and that conversation is going to continue at the Capitol. Uh, one of the concerns expressed is that this would incentivize the legislature to not increase taxes to increase overall education funding. Uh, that this would also encourage um, them to sort of put the load on the local school districts to say, well, you can take some of your building fund and fund your teacher pay raise. Uh, we don't need to give you any more money. Is that going to happen? Is, is that a risk here with this question? I don't think so because, I mean, there's superintendents in the room, there's teachers that are all going to be at the Capitol, I promise, next legislative session saying that that's not the case and that they need more funding. I mean, that's going to happen no matter if state question 801 passes or not. So to me, this just gives them flexibility to use the money that they have right now and then the conversation will continue about increasing dollars to education long term. Well, why, so why would, the state chamber didn't write the state joint resolutions, sure. but as far <laughs> as I know, but uh, why not instead of pushing this, push a, you know, greater, uh, uh, the ability to t tax locally to increase, you know, beyond the five sure. mills. Why, why not take that forward rather than offer I don't, this flexibility? I don't think it's an either or, David. I mean, I think we can advocate for flexibility at the local level for the dollars that they have now and continue to have the conversation about do we need more money in education overall. Mm -hmm. I think those are conversations that can happen parallel and are happening parallel now. Mm -hmm. uh, what, uh, so just give me a quick picture for both of you, but I'll start with Mr. Heim. There's a question of inequities in school, uh, school facilities among districts. What, what, what does that picture look like now? What, what, do you, what do you see, what do we know of in terms of wealth, property wealthy districts, property poor districts? What do they have and don't have? Well, there's no doubt we have inequity in school facilities. We have uh, every study that's been done on Oklahoma school finance where it comes to capital improvement, we have inequities. We're one of only four states that does not have any state money to help equalize facility dollars. So all of it has to come from local property wealth. So the more local property wealth you have, you can, the more you can pass bond issues or use building funds, have nicer buildings, you know, more adequate buildings. We have some schools because of property value increase has been much slower than cost of construction. We have some schools that, that can't, if they pass the maximum bond issue, they wouldn't be able to build a building to replace one of their school buildings. So there are a lot of issues with equity in school uh, buildings, that's something we've been looking at a lot because, again, one of only four states that doesn't have money to help to where our poorest schools would get a, some kind of matching 20 cents on the dollar or something that helps them, if you pass a bond issue, match it to have equity there. Uh, this obviously wouldn't help that because this would actually move the money across the other direction rather than moving more into facilities. Well, and I would just say to that, I mean, to me, I haven't understood the this will add inequity into the system argument just in the sense of this, you can't kind of have it both ways. We, we talk about how this doesn't add new money into the system, right? This is the exact money that schools already have. We're just giving flexibility in how they spend it. So ultimately, if you aren't adding any money into the system, you aren't adding any new inequity into the system. Oh, and so. I would agree. I'm not, I'm, I've never, I've made several comments on this and I've never been on the side of that somehow this is going to create more inequity in our in our revenue for schools. The inequity is already there on the capital improvement side and this this is not going to change it because it's not adding dollars to to, to cross over to uh, the current expenditure side. So I don't I don't see a big change in that. My biggest concern is what does it do at our legislative level 
you know, if next year at the Capitol we're talking about investing more money in schools and the conversation is around where well, didn't we vote to pass 801, and I know what you're saying, Jennifer, but our history is that, you know, 12 years ago we got a teacher pay raise and then we didn't get another teacher pay raise for 12 years. Our history is underfunding public schools. I mean, we are 48th in the nation and dead last in our region for a reason. It's not because we have a history of ongoing investments in public education. So sometimes we, the fear from the education community is, is based on history and fact that we look for excuses not to fund public schools rather than solutions and a way to fund public schools to a level, an adequate level. And I would just say, it seems like to me, and, and I think Sean would agree, that, I mean, history has changed, right? I mean, last, last year was historic and what we saw, and the, the, the voice is very loud. And I think if that happens, you know, I mean, I think there will be pushback to say, look, this gave us some flexibility, but we need to ha continue to have a conversation about additional funding into education. And I, I just don't see that the teachers and the superintendents of the school board, you know, members across the state, letting the legislature do that. Right. How, how, how does this compare with this, this structure that we have and the limits that we have, five mills and, and the other mills that we use for funding uh, uh, schools, how does it compare with other states? Uh, the, the question of state dollars for, for capital expenses aside. Right. For overall funding, our, uh, our funding system, uh, the way it was created, we actually, history-wise, go to history lesson. In 1907, we kind of stole South Dakota's constitution to start with and built from there. We fund our local schools uh, far more on state revenue and state dedicated revenue than people like our friends to the South in Texas. So there's a lot more local revenue involved. They still have an equity formula, equalization formula, but it's based more on local revenue, local property taxes. For whatever reason, when we created ours, it was, we had fewer property taxes and we've since put caps on the growth of those property taxes to where we more and more depend on the state legislature to appropriate money. So when I talk to people like Senator Dossett, and he says, well, why do we spend 35% of our state budget on common education and we're still last in per pupil funding? We have to go through that history of because we have very low property taxes in Oklahoma. And on top of that, schools are capped at the amount they can raise in local property taxes, not only for capital improvements cap, but we're capped on the revenue that goes to teacher salaries and technology and those other items that are in the general operating fund. So it's, it's really a st structural issue but that's a very difficult thing to change. And that's where, that's the conversation I'd like us to have is on our overall funding structure uh, moving forward. Yeah, and I think, you know, from uh, the perspective of, well, from what we've seen, it's really hard to have an apples to apples comparison of school funding formula from state to state, right? I mean, every state does it differently. It's incredibly complex. I, you know, Oklahoma Achieves has done a, a report on kind of how to fund our schools across the state, and it's 43 pages long. If you have some insomnia, you can go to our website and read it, um, but it's complicated, right? And so, you know, ultimately, from what we've been able to see, we're the only state that kind of locks some of these local dollars into a building fund, from what we've been able to see from across the country. And so, I mean, we think that this is just an arcane, I mean, it's been on the books, it's been on, in the Constitution for 65 years. You know, our, why are we doing something that's 65 years old whenever we're looking at a, a totally different education system than, than we had then? And just, we think that school districts ultimately should have the flexibility to decide how to spend their local dollars and, and not have it locked in kind of this building fund that's been there for 65 years for who knows kind of what reason. I would say maybe with the term building fund, but um, as a guy who's done a lot of study on school finance as well, every state has defined capital improvement funding versus current expenditure funding and has a separation of those in some way because of keeping equity. Most people have different forms of keeping equity in both of them, but there's not a crossover um, nationally in any, any state, a true crossover between both so that they can keep some type of school equity. So it wouldn't be, a lot of them it is bond funds and they allow local communities to, to pass more bonds than our 10% sure. mm -hmm. cap that we have in Oklahoma. I think yeah. our building fund is kind of a, a some kind of supplemental mm -hmm. to that bond right. fund cap. It's kind well, of an yeah. anomaly, yeah. I mean. 
Well, let me ask, just before we go to the audience, um, uh, you mentioned OK 2030 plan from the State Chamber. Uh, how, how does this proposal sort of fit into that? I know the plan talks about increasing classroom spending. Sure. Are there any other elements of that? How does this all fit together? What, is your goal to in just increase classroom spending? Is that the priority here that seems to play into that? Yeah, it's a broader vision. And Sean and I both have been very heavily involved in, a, I think it's been two years now, a two-year task force that's kind of taking a top-to-bottom look at our school funding formula. So in, in regards to 2030 and how 801 specifically fits in and why we're supporting it is because we believe it's a, it's a first step to give school districts flexibility in how they spend their current funding. And then we can have a broader conversation, and we are having a broader conversation, about are we funding our schools in the best way? Um, and that's a conversation that's going to continue. We'll see some changes, I think, I hope, in the next legislative session. And, and that's a conversation that's going to continue. Well, do you think the state chamber wants to, you know, they, we gave teachers a pay raise, the average $6,000, sure. $100, something like that. Yep. Is the chamber in favor of increasing overall education spending per pupil spending through the state aid formula? Yeah, I think, you know, from a te so take teacher pay. We, we long have been supportive of getting teachers to the regional average. We know from the private sector that you have to pay mm -hmm. a competitive wage to get good employees. We mm -hmm. know that we have to fund, you know, a capital expenditures, whatever. Bin businesses understand that you have to put money in to see success, right? And so what that dollar figure is, you know, I don't think any of us, I mean, certainly, you know, not on stage and, and in the audience, I mean, Senator Dossett and others, we don't have that figured out yet. That's a conversation that is going to continue, and we very much want to be a part of making sure that we are funding our schools in an adequate way and make sure that we're getting the best, making sure that our students have all the skills that they need to get their dream job. Are they in favor of an increase? <laughs> I don't know specifically. I mean, as far as I think we are definitely a part of the conversation. Mr. Heim. Uh, yes, we're in favor of <laughs> Yes, I figured so. Uh, but uh, what, what's your sense uh, going into the session next year? Teacher pay raise, a little increase, I think, in general education funding. Uh, but in the meantime, we have many other agencies in need, mental health, corrections. They're all saying we, we've taken cuts. We haven't, we've been stagnant. We need a piece of that pie too. What, what's your confidence level in trying to get that? Well, our conversation with legislative leaders has been that's a great first step. Uh, we need a plan similar to Roads and Bridges, where we have an eight year plan that invests annually. Again, we still have class sizes that are way too large. We have kindergarten classes with 30 plus students, elementary classes uh, very similar, high school classes 40 plus. I think people understand class size issues. We have mandates on the book, reforms that we can't carry out because we don't have the money. They were, those were waived because of budget cuts over the last decade. Teacher pay was great, but the, all of that money went to salary increases. Now we need to be able to hire teachers back to improve class sizes. Department of Education has done research that it'll cost over $320 million just to get back and pay for the mandates that are in state law. And I think we think those are in good things. Reading sufficiency remediation class size mandates, things that really help us educate students. So all the uh, legislative leaders I've talked to have talked about implementing a long-term plan, hopefully front-loading it. I know uh, Floor Leader Eccles said just a few weeks ago that he, his thought is trying to get $500 million over the next two years into public education to invest in those things. I think that would be a huge step forward and get us closer to that regional average in per pupil funding. And I'll say from the state chamber perspective, you know, we've, I think Sean and I might be the only, you know, some of the only people in the state, maybe we'll see if you have, read the whole ESSA plan, <laughs> like all 700 pages of our state. So we do, we, we are definitely supportive of having a long-term plan and looking at what that looks like from a comprehensive state, not just looking at funding. Obviously we support state 01, state question 801 and giving flexibility that we have with the funding now. But looking comprehensively at what do we need to do in education moving forward, it's incredibly important to business to make sure that we have a great education system in Oklahoma. Let's go to the audience for questions. If you have any questions, just please raise your hand and Sierra will be, come to you and you can ask away. Not everyone at uh, <laughs> We did a great this job. Yeah, I'm yeah, gonna break the we ice. answered all your questions. Okay, this is all good. And we kind of hung up on salaries, but you know, newspapers have put us in a position to where 
you want a, a, a case of paper, you know the difference in the cost today and what it was 15 years ago? Uh, do you realize that our communities have five mills that they can be taxed? We've been at maximum in my community since 1956. Maximum. We're never going to have an increase in our taxes because we're already at maximum. And consequently, it allows us to do a lot of good things. Now, there's a general mistrust of the legislature. So what's your, what would be your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the question is, will those folks have the ability to take dollar for dollar out of the formula because some school districts will get more money out of their, out of their uh, assessed evaluation? And with that, they'll deduct that same amount from the general fund? So I'll say on state question 801, it does not impact the school funding formula at all. So moving, it, let's say school districts chose to take all five mills and put it into their operation dollar, it does not hurt them from the funding formula. I know what you're talking about generally is if giving school districts the ability to raise it even more beyond what they're taxing now, um, but state question 801 specifically does not change anything in the funding formula or penalize any schools if they were to move money into operations. Any other question? Thank you. Good thought. Um, any other question? Over here. Thanks. I'm a mom, and I know that you both, we were actually talking right beforehand, you both have your own kids. Speak to me as a parent about what this means to you. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, for me, I have a four-year-old and a three-year-old, and I, huh? I was asking Joe where's his question. Your, your partner that came with you got to ask a question. Why can't he ask a question? He works with Come me. Come on, that's the He you, can. I was you got to you yeah. plant some you got questions, plant Sean. Right. You're a professional. Well, you Come on. Go. I like the parent question. <laughs> Christy will be mad at me that we didn't plant the parent question. Go ahead. So I have a four-year-old and a three-year-old. I actually sit on a school board. So, I mean, I think for me, I want my kids' school board, and I, I, Sean agrees with this, right? That I, I want my kids' school board deciding what is best for my kids' school and my kids' school district and saying this and making a recommendation, right? So the, the superintendent and school board's job is to make recommendations and to approve a budget every year and to say, to look out what's best for the school. I think they are perfectly capable of doing that, and I think that the school board and not the state is best to say how those lo local dollars should be spent. Mr. Heim. As a parent, I agree the school board should make those decisions. The concern I have as a parent is most of my family's from Kansas. My cousin's children in Kansas have $40,000 more invested in them in their K-12 education than my children. That's what worries me. Are we not getting the same opportunity? And, and this is, and I hope you're right there beside me at the Capitol when we're talking about making the investment so we're offering the same kind of resources to our teachers, to our classrooms, so that we have the education opportunities that our neighboring states do. Thank you. Other question? Hi. So there was an editorial today in the Oklahoman, and it says, for years it's been noted that officials in many districts who say they can't give teachers a raise nonetheless find millions for athletic amenities or other similar expenditures. Are you concerned about the public's misconception between um, sinking fund money where millions of dollars maybe can be raised locally and this five mills and how can you make sure that people understand what the difference is? I would say yes. That's, that's part of the biggest problem in the beginning in talking to board members at our region meetings and other things is they're equating this with bond issues where local people do vote and the patrons in many districts are voting 80% for athletic facilities or those things. That doesn't mean that money could go to teacher salaries. It could never go to teacher salaries and they can't pass a bond issue for teacher salaries. Those are local decisions through bond dollars and increasing local taxes. As, as we talked about earlier, this is that finite five mills and giving flexibility there, my feeling is I really don't think schools will change. I just hope we have continue that conversation to make sure that our legislators and our voters don't think that this increased the money you're talking about for schools to redirect from any 
local decision in a bond issue to something in the general fund. And we have just stressed from the very beginning that this is all about flexibility with current dollars. So no new taxes. You know, this is all about taking flexibility of the dollars that they have yeah. now. Could you, but, could you help? And I'm glad you did. Could you help and talk more about make sure they know it's a building fund? Because a lot of the stuff I've seen well, come out, just like that editorial, it says flexibility with ad valorem dollars. Well, the, people think ad valorem dollars. Most citizens think bond issues. Most citizens don't even know the building fund exists. Yeah. To them, their at, their property taxes are what I vote on a on a, a bond issue. So so many people think that I'm going to be able to go for vote for a bond issue of additional money to help in this arena. Well, well what I would say too. Sorry, just real quick, right, like ahead. on on the building fund specifically. I mean, you're right. People don't understand that some of their local dollars are like locked in this like arcane thing that they have to spend this money on these certain things. I don't think that they understand that. So I mean, to me. I think this is about explaining that like local dollars, local school boards should be able to decide what those local dollars are spent on yeah. and that there's not a need to like put this five mils in a separate building. I take a little issue with the arcane piece because building operations and maintenance and remodeling is not arcane. And we know from even the data of reporting that our schools are spending between one and a half and three times the amount of money that they have in their building fund for those items. So it's not that we're that I all just of a mean sudden, it's been in the Constitution right. for 65 now, years I'm, this I'm way. I'm fine with that. I just don't, again, we're not freeing, we're not lowering the gates and freeing up new yeah. dollars. Yeah. Well, I, just a point of explanation, bond issues. Uh, we did a story a few years ago about Catoosa Public Schools. Our reporter Jennifer Palmer worked on that. And, um, but they had issued bonds and they, they made improvements in their stadium. They added, a, I think, a new press box. I can't even remember all the details. but. My question is, is the building fund, my understanding is the sinking fund is used to pay off that debt. Uh, yes. And then schools have all kinds of ranges of mills to be able to pay that debt. Uh, some are above 30 mills, right? But is the building fund ever used to as basically collateral it for bond? No. It can't. It cannot use the no. building fund for Building that. fund would not be collateral for bond issue. So it's it separate be, taxation. It cannot be used to pay off that voted upon debt. The building fund is now a permanent levy, uh, five mils or five mils mm -hmm. plus whatever the property tax, personal property tax would have been for those range of, of expenditures. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it doesn't, it can't be used to pay off the debt that was voted on by so the So it's the sinking fund. Sinking I never funds. thought I'd have a panel where I'm talking about <laughs> sinking funds, yeah. but uh, that's, why, that's, that's why there's so many people yeah. here. Yeah. Sinking fund is the way you pay off your mortgage. That's what way I explain it in school finance 101. You basically you build the building, you take a loan out, build the building, that's the, the, the bond money. Sinking fund is annual money that comes to pay off that mortgage or that right. debt until it's completely yeah. paid off. Well, and one thing, I mean, you brought up the mortgage, and so the way that I've kind of thought about State Question 801 too is, you know, so I as a person, you know, I own a home, right? So I might sock away some money every year in case my air conditioning goes out. Mm -hmm. But if in 2018 my air conditioning doesn't go out, then maybe I choose to spend that money to go on vacation with my kids, or I choose to buy school clothes for them, or whatever it is. So to me, that's how I view State Question 801 is it's like, yes, schools should definitely put aside money for building maintenance. That's important. Communities are not, will not let their school board just let buildings crumble. But in years where they do not need that money, can they be flexible in how they spend it on local needs? We think that they should be able to. Other questions? In the back. Hi. Um, Will 801 affect custodial and other non-certified support staff salaries, or um, are the funds earmarked for certified personnel only? Well, we can currently use, the building fund can currently be used for custodial or maintenance salaries, security salaries, those salaries associated with the building. So it sure wouldn't affect them unless they were moved out of that to some other staff. It's not, it doesn't really say certified, it just, it's operational cost as deemed by the Board of Education. And I'll say that, you know, State Question 801 does not mandate anything on any school district. So if a school district is doing something right now that they, the school board and superintendent want to continue doing, it does not require any changes at all. Um, anyone, let's give a chance for anyone who hasn't asked a question yet. What are the potential detrimental effects of the passage of this state question 
What's the worst case scenario? None. I think it's great. <laughs> well, uh, probably the same reason that we had legislators vote against it and some of the discussion earlier, the question I think the gentleman down here asked was if there's a perception, the worst thing is if there's a perception that it does change or increase school funding, then that'll hurt our chances of getting long-term investments in school funding. And I, I agree. I think we have made huge progress at the state capitol, but we also have a pretty long history of having one big push and then a decade or so layoff. So we have to make sure that there's no perceived movement from this question that it's now going to be the panacea for school funding and we don't need to do anything else because this is going to improve what schools can do, improve teacher salaries and let t schools hire teachers and that's just not true. Have you heard anyone talking who, who's, who's expressed a belief that that's what the question is about? Yes. Okay. Yes. And when we've gone around, as we've gone around the state and talked to groups there is that feeling because of the conversation about it gives you freedom for your ad valorem dollars. So they're thinking, mm -hmm. well, we're going to be able to go pass a bond issue after this to pay for teacher salaries, or we're going to have, be able to increase ad valorem just for these items, not realizing it's taking money that we're spending over here already that's already being spent mm -hmm. in custodian salaries, maintenance, et cetera. So that's really our talking points are all about that concern. It's not about being against it. It's just as you look at it, please make sure that your patrons understand it does not increase funding for schools. And I'll say, and I know you aren't saying this, so from the state chamber perspective, we've definitely been very clear that this is not new money, not new taxes into the system, that this is just flexibility for the money that's already there. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to be very clear about what we think, that this is just flexibility to local districts. Any other questions? Um, so for Tulsa Public Schools, this would not yield any additional dollars for us. W what districts are going to be gaining from this, and what kind of dollars are we talking about if they are, who has capacity to go up to their five mils? No districts would gain from this. Everybody's maxed out that building fund of five mils, so no district would increase funding for this. It just gives, it, it potentially could give districts flexibility to use funding for other things outside of what they're using it for now, but it doesn't, it doesn't change. Every district across the state is at that maximum five mils. But does that change from year to year where, you know, they're maxed out on five and it's all committed and then the next year or three years from then there's kind of a dip and they have this extra, like you said, the air conditioner is working, you don't need to replace it, so you could then step in and use it for something else. Does that happen or is everyone just totally maxed out every year and can't even spare a penny? I would say they're already maxed out because they're having, they're already spending general fund money for custodial salaries, utilities, and other things that they could be spending building fund money for. So if for some reason their air conditioner lasted 25 years versus 20, they still have double what they have in the fund that could come out. So they could, they could move general fund money to that. We're more likely to move general fund money to the building fund than to now decide we're gonna move building fund to the general fund. Mm. I mean, that's that's the, you know, that, that crossover. It's still, the, they're, they're still the same dollars and we're still, yeah. Uh, woefully underfunded. And I'll say, I mean, it, there are di there are plenty of districts that are being very flexible with their building fund now, and we just think the Constitution should reflect what is actually happening in practice in schools. I, w I would say our schools are being constitutionally, <laughs> they're not breaking the Constitution. No, 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 I'm not saying that they are. <laughs> there, no, are statutory, yeah, there are statutory no, definitions I, for right, equipment and sure. other things that have given right. that flexibility. I just, to okay. me, what the Constitution says is it's locked in for, for what is perceived as, we're talking about perception, right, as building maintenance. There are districts that are using it for much broader things mm -hmm. than, than just building maintenance. Do we have any other questions? <laughs> This gentleman here. <laughs> <laughs> Your name's not Dawson. Okay, is how is 801 going to help the small schools whose assessed evaluation is never going to change? The Welches, the Kentas, the Copans, the Haskells, the Pacolas, the Bacoshis, their assessed evaluation is never going to change. How is 801 going to help them? But they're all at five now. So, I mean, they, so it, it, Every school is maxed out, so it impacts every school, whether they're a rural school, subur suburban school, urban school, exactly the same way. Well, what he was talking about was assessed valuation. So the property values in many schools have 
growth in property value versus that. What county are you talking about? Because I used to play baseball against a few of those schools <laughs> in Northeast Oklahoma. Uh, but what his idea is that their property values will never grow. The, uh, I, I, yeah, yeah. And it really won't, I agree with sure. you, it won't yeah. change much, but they're sure not going to have change because their property value is so low that their fund is not growing as the costs are increasing. They're not getting more money even to cover the current cost, which is a big issue. Well, spe speaking of numbers, I have a few. The average uh, assessed valuation uh, it, per student is 49600 That may be a few, lagging a few years. Uh, Tulsa Public Schools, 63000 Edmond, 76000 Middell, 35000 I don't think they're going to be catching up anytime soon. So I guess that raises that question, will the wealthy districts have the flexibility, more in reality have more flexibility than these schools whose valuations are really not going to grow that much? Well, I would say no, just because I know, I've talked to board members and superintendents in Edmond or Jinx or those places where we think they have more valuation and they're so maxed out on their building fund with current needs that they could, we could double the amount coming in and they would still have needs for those in those approved area so I don't see them doing that again as I said so I, I don't see it being in, in creating more inequity and I don't see it freeing up dollars for for other expenditures yeah. Yeah. do we have any other questions I would just follow up on this lady's questions about what are the potential detriments and do you think that given that no one no district is going to get additional monies out of this state question we will end up in the posture that we are with the lottery where people are constantly asking. I thought the lottery was supposed to fix all of this. Where's our lottery money? And we do have lottery money, but it's certainly not the panacea that everyone thought it was going to be and the dollars that, that were projected out of that. I'm just, do you have that concern? I mean, I personally don't, only in the sense of the, do so the lottery did put in additional dollars. I mean ultimately this does not put in additional dollars it does not create any new taxes and so we can fight the perception and I'm I will stand right beside John and say that 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 is the case but it doesn't do what the lottery did so I don't think it's an apples to apples comparison at all but I do think that's the fear I think that's the fear among a lot of people because of things like the lottery the lottery was completely different because it was projected to create $300 million a year for education, and we're getting about $30 million now, so there's a big difference in projection versus reality, and this is not being projected or sold as giving a dollar figure. It's just very important that we share with the public before they vote on it and after they vote on it and ongoing that the question does not allow local boards to raise revenue. The question just allows them to move it from one pot of money to another where both are already be, are underfunded. And it gives them more flexibility to spend it on what they think they should locally. Any other questions out there? All right, well, we'll uh, turn to, I guess, final remarks. Uh, tell us the one thing you want people to remember when they go to the polls and they see this 801 on the ballot. What should they keep in mind most of all, Ms. Hunt, Ms. Muddies? I'll, uh, you know, I'll go back to, I feel like, you know, I'm kind of a broken record, but I think local school boards and local superintendents are best to determine what their local dollars should be spent on. And I hope that the people of Oklahoma see that they want to determine how their local tax dollars are spent in their local community, and they'll vote yes on State Question 801. Mr. Heim. Well, um, what I would hope people do is uh, go to the polls and vote however you would like on this, but I want all of you to go talk to your legislators today, tomorrow, anybody in Senator Dossert's district, come up and talk to him after this and make sure he knows we need to continue to fund public schools. We need a long-term investment in our schools so that we can compete for teachers, uh, resources, technology, and other things with our peer states, just like we talk about doing in the business community so that our kids can have the highest quality education possible. Uh, and that's what we expect. Thank you. Please give our guests a round of applause. Thank you.